Well, welcome. Glad that you guys are here this morning. Um, as we talked about last week, um, with this new year comes a new sermon series. And uh, of course, last week we had a great time kind of reflecting on what 2019 held for us as a, as a brand new baby church, uh, getting to reflect on all the great things that God has allowed us to be part of, all the things that, um, that we've been able to kind of step out in faith and, and participate in. And it's just, um, I don't know about you guys, but I just kind of stand amazed when I think about that, think about everything that was accomplished over the last 11 months, uh, 10 months really, of us being uh, a body of Christ working together and uh, serving together and just pursuing Him. And so I'm really thankful for, the, uh, for last year, but um, as we kind of step into 2020, I'm also really excited about uh, what we're facing, what's on the horizon for us. And I just know that God has uh, some God-sized things for us this year, and I know that um, <clears throat> kind of as we talked about in our Ruth series, this this uh, uh, this extraordinary God using ordinary people uh, in his in his perfect plan to do amazing things, and so uh, I have no doubt that we're going to experience that uh, in some form over the next several months, and so. Um, Anyway, so that, that kind of leads us to where we are here today, uh, 2020. Uh, it's a brand new year, brand new things on the horizon. And uh, of course, we're going to be kicking off this brand new series, and it is uh, entitled Becoming the Me I Ought to Be. And, uh, becoming the Me I Ought to Be. I know that, that, uh, that slide looks like I actually hand wrote it, uh, but I did not. We, we actually found a sloppy font, and we used it on purpose because, um, because life is sloppy. Life is messy, and we're we're in it, and we're you know we're drudging through it, and, and all these different things. We kind of come up against these different uh, these different trials, these different struggles, and uh, in the midst of those things, the way we respond, the way we handle them, they shape us. And of course, we can you know as we, again like we talked about last year, right? We can handle them in our normal ways. We can respond in our flesh. We can we can act like somebody who doesn't know any better and you know, have a, have a human response that is um, not encouraging to anybody else or ourselves, or we can pause and we can respond in ways that actually stretch us. We can stop and we can pray and ask God to give us strength and mercy and grace that we can extend to other people. And, and that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on here through this series is, is becoming the me I ought to be. And of course, this is, this is intentional. We're doing the me I ought to be at the beginning of the year because, of course, what does everybody do, right? The last evening of the year, I know every one of you ever sitting around, you're, just, you're watching, waiting for the ball to drop, watching Carson Daly, trying to figure out what Miss Hope or whatever her name is was wearing, you know, those Martian boots and the furry, the feathery sleeve things, and you were writing out the ways that you wanted to be, be a better person. The, the, the solution, the resolutions point to being a, a better version of, of me. You write down your resolutions. You're like, you know what, this last year, I failed at this, 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 and this. And, you know, in the coming year, I, I want to change that stuff. I want, to, I want to be a better version of me. You know, we, we think about the activities that we want to do this year. We think about the change in our attitude that we want to present this year. We think about all these different things. And, and before we really kind of dig into all of this stuff and we start talking about resolutions and becoming a better version of us, I really want us to kind of work from a, a unified definition here. And uh, So I asked the Google um, what resolution means, and, and this is roughly what the Google said to me in response. It's a firm decision to do or not do something. A resolution is, is a firm decision to do or not do something. To become the person that you want to become requires you to adjust. Either you start doing something that you didn't do previously or you stop doing something you were doing previously. It's a firm decision. A firm decision. I made a firm decision that I would continue not exercising this year. So far, 100%. I'm winning. So, 
for us to make resolutions, for us to take a, a step in the direction of changing who we are, we have to make a decision to do or to not to do something, right? And, and it starts with us sitting down and saying, okay, so, so I don't like this thing, or, or, or I see this other person, I would really like to be like that. We want to change habits. We want, to, we want to stop doing some habits, or we want to start doing some habits. And then we want to lose weight. We've got to push away from the table and not eat that third plate of mac and cheese, right? I got to start going to the gym. I want to let go of anger. I got to stop. Yeah, I got to. I need to forgive somebody. I need to offer forgiveness. I need to forgive them in my heart. Whether I have a conversation with them or not, I need to let go of that anger. And the only way to start that healing process within yourself is to let go by forgiving them. Maybe you need to go to somebody and ask them for forgiveness. Maybe, maybe letting go of some anger, maybe it's because of something that started because you did something, or you need to go and ask for forgiveness. We want to separate ourselves from toxic people. We realize that there are people who just drag us down, who, who whenever we're around them, instead of encouraging us to healthy behavior and, and, and positive behavior, they actually encourage us to things that we know are not healthy for us, that go against things that we, we think are, are immoral. So moving away from toxic people. To read more books, I've seen a lot on social media about people saying, hey, I want to read 40 books this year. Now, I will tell you that I did that in college in a year. I think I did read 40 books. And I don't understand why anybody would aspire to that in a year. <laughs> it is terrible. It hurts. Maybe it's just me because I have this brain that you know, doesn't like to exercise either. And when I put books in front of it, it just it hurts. But, uh, but to read more books, maybe to go more places. I want to travel more in the new year. I decide that instead of going out to dinner every single night, I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to eat at home so that I can save money and I can go to the mountains and go to the beach I can go to Europe. Wherever it is that you aspire to go, you've got to think about, okay, I want to do this, so therefore I have to either do or not do these things. Right? It's a firm decision to do or not do something. If we want to adjust who we are, we have to make some changes. For some folks, it was to engage people and make new friends. Some of you guys are introverts. And when we talk about engaging our neighbors, you recoil and you start sucking your thumb and you start crying a little and I feel sorry for you because I'm not you and I want to talk to everybody and you look at me and you think I'm crazy and that's okay. And for some of you, you're like, I have engaged way too many people, so I need to take a break. I need to step back from this and I need to kind of focus on, on my relationship with Christ and, and doing some things just within my family. And so maybe that's, maybe that's your resolution this year. For some, it's to just get serious about their religious views. To increase their relationship with Christ and to start a Bible reading plan to get connected to a church. You know, a lot of folks are, 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 are stepping into a church this morning somewhere for the very first time. Like ever. And some people have woken up this morning and they said, hey, you know what? Something in my life has to change. And I remember when I was a teenager, I was in this youth group, and, and I remember how positive that was. And maybe if I just go back to the church, maybe, maybe something positive will happen in my life this year. We can go on for days and days with these lists of things that, that we need to add or to remove from our lives so that we can... We can Become a person that we want to be. No matter what it is that we're thinking, that we're processing through, we have to make it a firm decision to do or not do something. And all of it is in an effort to become a person that we want to be. And all of these things, when we, when we start making our resolutions, very rarely do you go and stand and look in the mirror and say, hey you, you should be like something, and it's something that you're seeing. 
Usually, when you make your resolutions, it's because you've been looking around. You see other people in your lives. You see Facebook posts of people living the good life, right? They're living that life. So, you know, we get these, we get these posts of people who are just like, how do they travel all the time? Well, really, they only went on one trip. They just keep slowly pushing information out, right? <laughs> or they take the selfie, and it's like everything in the background is perfect, and yet if you were to zoom out a little bit, you would see chaos and mess, but yet what's presented is something different. And so a lot of times our decisions to change who we are are influenced by the outside world, by the other people that we see. Others in our lives, we just think, you know, I, I ought to be a little bit more like them. I ought to be a little friendlier. I ought to be a little more forgiving. I ought to be a little more nice. I ought to be whatever. And, and a lot of times, the things that we decide that we need to change about ourselves, they're influenced by other people. And so as we kind of process through this stuff, for the next few weeks, I, I really want us to kind of, kind of twist this and, and take our eyes off of the world around us. I want us to process how to become the me I ought to be, how to, how to become the you that you ought to be by looking at what God has to say about all of this. Now, for all of our intents and purposes, we're actually going to be working from the presupposition that every single person in this room, every single person who watches our sermons online, every single person who is stepping into this is operating from a place of wanting to become a little bit stronger in their religious belief. Now, they're, 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 they're stepping forward in, in, in a faith-based concept of changing who they are, recognizing that they need something different in their lives. And again, maybe that's you. Now, you might be the person who's sitting here today and you don't fully understand, you don't fully understand what it means to be a Christian. Maybe, maybe you hear us talking about reading the Bible and, and and you talk about us living a Christian life, and, and you don't really fully understand it, you don't really grasp it. And maybe you're here and you're, you're still thinking, hey, you know what, I think Christianity might still just be a myth. You guys are all suckers, but I've been hearing a lot of people talk about it. i got this crazy neighbor who keeps coming to my house and trying to be my friend, and they keep talking to me about this whole Christianity thing, and I just think, they're, I just think it's messed up. And just to get them off my back, I, I thought I would show up. And Maybe that's you. Maybe you're just trying to... Maybe you're just trying to, to tech, check, a, check a box and say, hey, I went to worship service, I went to a church this morning, and I get off my back. Maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're here today, and, and you've, you've been thinking about, okay, so this year I really want to step into more activity for Christ. I've been lukewarm in 2019. I, 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 have, I have, yes, I've, I've got my get out of hell free card, but I haven't really done much more than that. I've been living a lukewarm life. And you're thinking, I want to take a step deeper in my relationship with Christ. I want to, I want to do something different this year that's, that's a little more meaningful. I want, to, I want to experience some things that I'm hearing other people talk about experiencing. How do you adjust that one thing what is the one thing that you make the firm decision about that will take you closer to Jesus? And now, there may be some of you who are thinking, all right, Pastor Shannon, I don't need any of this stuff because I've got it all figured out. I've got this whole Christian life figured out. Everything is going smashingly well. I wish you would just move on to something else. And to those of you who are thinking that, I want to go ahead and give you this microphone and let you come up and teach us because none of the rest of us have got any of that figured out, right? We all have something to learn. We all have room to grow. We all have things that we need to change to be the me I ought to be. No matter where you fall on that spectrum, I want to challenge you. I want to, I want to, challenge, I want to challenge us together. That as we approach this series and, and, and we kind of dig into the next few weeks of study, that we, we do so open-handed. That we walk in with open hands, with open hearts, with open minds. And we just ask God to really speak. 
speak to me personally, speak to you personally. And show you and me and all of us together collectively something. Something that we need to change that will make us become the me that we want to be, that we ought to be. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at, at ways to become the me I ought to be. We're going to talk about different components of life and explore how these things can transform us, how they can impact our lives and shape us into a better version of ourselves. And today we're going to be starting this journey of the me I ought to be by looking at Paul's letter to Timothy. Now I want to give you a little bit of history for those of you who are, are history buffs, nerds, whatever you want to call yourselves, who like this kind of thing. I'll tell you guys that Paul met Timothy during his second missionary journey. Uh, he became Paul's co-worker. He, uh, he traveled with him. He was on the road with, with Paul and Silas for, for several years. They, they mentored him. Paul shared his life with Timothy. Uh, and he prepared him to actually step into the mission that God was calling Timothy into, right? And so Paul invested his life. He invested time. He spoke into Timothy's life and prepared him. And he, he gave... He gave Timothy some foundational information that would help him become the pastor that he would ultimately be, that he would become the guy that God was calling him to be, that he would become the person that God was asking him that he should be. So Paul and Timothy, we're going we're to look at Paul's letter to Timothy, and the passage we're going to focus on today is 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, and you have that there in your notes. And uh, at the point of this letter... Uh, Timothy has actually stepped into leadership, and Paul's writing to him to encourage him. He's already kind of stepped into pastoring and, and caring for a group of people, and Paul's writing to him. And, and, and I'll take this moment to remind you guys, so as we, as we talk about the Bible, as we talk about Scripture, that everything that we have today in this book is actually handwritten information. Uh, it reflects actual events that really occurred. It's written by real people. It's not anything that's made up. Everything in there is, is trustworthy. And in Paul's day, he didn't have this. For him to refer to scriptures, he was talking about scrolls that were kept in the temple and you know, you'd have to go and you'd have to unroll these big, huge things. He didn't have it as easy as we do these days, but but I want to remind us that, that our, our modern Bible wasn't around back in, in Paul's day. And in Paul's day, what they actually had on those scrolls was the law and the prophets. And we've talked about that, right? The law and the prophets. And, and all of that stuff eventually just kind of pointed to Jesus. And this is the thing that, this is the thing that we really need to keep in mind. The, the law and the prophets all pointed to Jesus. And then Jesus came to earth and he said, he said hey, I've got a new way for you got some new commands for you. I want you to love each other like I've loved you. Right? He did these different things. I want you to go out and make disciples. He gave us a couple things that, that really kind of embody all of the old stuff. If we just take on these couple of things that Jesus told us to do, then we accomplish most of everything that was outlined in the, in the Law and the Prophets. Jesus came and he lived his life and he walked with 12 guys and he taught those 12 guys in those three years that he invested in those 12 guys. You know, Jesus was then crucified and buried and resurrected and he told them all about it. He was like, hey guys, look, there's a day coming when I'm not going to be with you. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. Y'all are going to be all worked up. But then I'm going to come back to life. And it's kind of interesting because Jesus actually pulled it all off. So, and of course after he came back, that's when he gave the disciples the message to go out. Now, hey, go out and teach everybody what I've taught you for the last three years. Tell them about what you've seen. Tell them about the miracles. Tell them about the miracles that you personally have performed because I've given you that power. So the reason that we have our Bible today is because Jesus actually came and, and he, he lived his life in front of witnesses and he told them to go tell the story. 
And he did. And now here's Paul speaking into Timothy's life because Paul, when he was blinded on the Damascus Road, he spent time with the apostles and he was poured into and he was invested. He heard these stories and he gained understanding of who Jesus was. And then, of course, he was sent out. And now, here we are. Focus passage today, 2 Timothy 3, 14-17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And now from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and, excuse me, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now again, and it seems like I, it seems like I say this every week, we could spend several days breaking these few verses apart and digging in on all the different little components of them. But really the one thing that I want us to focus on today, the one thing, if you walk away with nothing else, the first thing on your notes, the main thing that we need to know about today is that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful. If you walk out with nothing else, I want you to understand that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful. Now again, as I opened today, I mentioned we're working on presuppositions. Everybody here is, is interesting and is interested in figuring out how to become a better person based on some sort of religious bent. Whether it's you're trying to debunk Christianity or whether it's you're trying to step, take a step closer to Jesus Christ and strengthen your Christian life. But either way, you're open to this idea of having a discussion of, of, of actually that there is a God and that He really exists and that He has something better for you. So the main thing that we all need to understand is, is that our modern day Bible... Our B-I-B-L-E, as it were. Exactly. It is the book for me, but it is, is a collection of writings that God Himself inspired. God Himself. He breathed out the words that are written here. God breathed. He spoke these words into the hearts and minds of people, and then He led them to write these things down. Later this year, we're going to get into an apologetic series, and we're in it, and it works from you know, God exists, miracles are possible, the Gospels are accurate representations and, and accounts of real life activity. Jesus uh, is who He said He is. He was raised from the dead, and the things that Jesus taught are reliable and trustworthy. So, working from that idea. God exists, and, and He exists, and, and in so existing, He prompted people through His Holy Spirit, He prompted people to write down things. He breathed into them through His Holy Spirit, He gave them insight, He gave them wisdom, He gave them these words, and miraculously convinced them to write these things down, and miraculously, He saved these things for centuries. I mean, we're still finding stuff, right? We're still finding stuff that's remarkable, that show, that just that add to the, to the value and the validity of Scripture. But God breathed these things. God breathed these things, this writing that we have, these books of the Bible, these stories, these letters from these guys. God breathed and he inspired them to write these things down. The second part of the statement, besides the God breathed part, that we really need to kind of you know, draw extra circles around is the useful part. It's useful. Our Bible is useful. It makes logical sense that if God exists and miracles are possible, that he did in fact inspire people to write accounts of real events. And if all those things are true, if we can come to the place where we say, okay, yeah, that's, that's all possible then don't, don't we believe that what he actually had them write down would be useful? It's useful for us. The Bible is useful. It's a resource 
that can be used to help us become the person we ought to be. It's a resource that can guide you through the different situations of life. And I've heard, you know, different people pose these, you know, random questions of, well, can the Bible tell me whether or not I need to buy this car? Give me a break. Yes, in that it tells you how to be a good steward. The Bible gives you instruction. It's useful. It's helpful. Can you open it up and see, Mike Davis, you're supposed to buy a car tomorrow. It should be a blue car. It should have this many miles. It should only cost this many. You're not going to see that. Give me a break. But you're going to see, you're going to see life lessons. You're going to see guidance that informs you on how to make the other decisions in your life. The Bible is going to guide you into becoming the person that you ought to be. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the modern Bible, I just want to real quickly kind of give you this, this real fast breakdown. There are two testaments in the Bible. We have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament. And, and the testament, the word testament is actually a covenant, it's a promise, right? So we have the Old Promise and we have the New Promise. Well, in our Old Testament, we have the Law. Uh, we also have the history of God. We have history of God creating everything. We have the history of God interacting with His creation. We see Him guiding and calling different people into action. Uh, we see it, it records God's promise, and this is you know part of that old promise is the promise to Abraham. It reveals in the prophecies we see the predictions of Jesus coming of a Messiah, uh, of someone who's going to come and change everything, change the world to be the ruler, to be the king for all of eternity. And then in the New Testament, the new promise, the new covenant, is the second part of the book, and it reveals the Messiah actually arriving on earth. We have accounts of Jesus' life and his activity. We see him engaging with different people. We see him performing different miracles. We see him speaking into the lives of the disciples. We see him engaging different people who are about to be stoned who are demon-possessed. The New Testament records the teachings of Jesus and what His actual teachings look like in, in practice. We see these things in the New Testament. The New Testament reveals the promise of salvation and eternity reconciled to God. And so collectively, we call all of this stuff Scripture today. Okay, we call this Bible when people refer to it, they may say the Bible, they may say the Scripture, they may say the Holy Scriptures, they may say all kinds of things, right? But at the end of the day, it's God's direction. It's His letter to us. It's His, it's His revelation written down so that we can understand Him and know Him. But in Paul's day, in his context, he only had the Law and the Prophets, and then he had the Stories. He had the stories from the guys who actually walked with Jesus. He had their investment into his life. And Jesus was the new covenant. He was the new promise. The disciples were the ones who were the first-hand witnesses to Jesus' life. and It's kind of really crazy if you start reading the New Testament and you see how many times Jesus does something and it's like, and this was done to fulfill the prophecy. There's a book you should read if you're if you're questioning this whole Jesus thing and, and whether he's actually who he claimed to be. Uh, it's the case for Christ, and uh, it is a great book, and it will rock your world if you are on the fence about this whole thing. But uh, and I don't have the numbers. I should have looked it up to have that for you today. But he talks about the number of prophecies that Jesus actually fulfilled, and. He lists, like, for them to be, you know, for there to be somebody who fulfills ten of them, it's this out of however many hundreds of millions of, opportunity, of people who could do that. And each time he mentions a bigger number of prophecies that were fulfilled, the number of people who could do that, the chances are smaller and smaller and smaller, and by the time it gets to the number of actual prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, it can only come down to one person, and it was Jesus. And he fulfilled them. And so, anyway, it's really interesting. I'm nerdy, I know God. So... But anyway, so moving on, Jesus lived his life, he shared his life with these disciples, and he's the Messiah, he, he, he's the Messiah that is promised in the law and the prophets, and Paul speaks to, to Timothy and he says, remember, remember the scriptures, remember the scriptures, remember what you've been taught. 
Because all of that points to the future. It points to Jesus who came to earth for us. And Paul kind of says, it, 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 Scriptures point us to wisdom for salvation. Points us to wisdom for salvation. The old law and the, and the prophecies point to Jesus. They inform us. They give us this understanding, this wisdom. So when Paul was speaking the scriptures, he's speaking the law that God gave the Israelites to inform them of, of how he expected them to live, of the different things that they needed to do to be made right in his sight, to experience blessings. Paul was speaking about the prophets who shared the different stories of the coming Messiah, the ultimate King and Savior of the world, the person who would be restoring peace and reconciling creation to the Creator. And Paul reminded Timothy that he had taught all these things, all this stuff, and that it pointed to the Messiah. They, they provided the knowledge, the wisdom for salvation. God got a hold of Paul. He was blinded. He had this vision. And Jesus addressed him and said, why are you persecuting me? And they have this exchange and, and of course Paul is blinded for a while after that and he gets this investment of the apostles speaking into him and it, it leads him to understanding and this wisdom of who Jesus is and it leads him to a salvation moment and it leads him into this life of ministry. And Paul is now pouring this all into Timothy. Remember the scriptures. Remember how they pointed to Jesus. These scriptures, the law, the prophets, they all point to the Messiah who is coming. Paul gave Timothy the information that he needed so that he could put his faith in Jesus. And the other thing we need to recognize in all of this is that Paul points him but not only is it the scripture, the prophecy, and the law, but it, it all points and informs us that we need to have faith in Jesus. Paul says that scripture is useful because it provides the wisdom for salvation. And that wisdom is, is there pointing to a Savior, prophesied Messiah. points to all that stuff and he says remember that Jesus Christ you have to have your faith there Timothy remember remember all that you've been taught that all of this stuff points to having your faith in Jesus Christ and I'm sure that as Timothy was on the road with Paul and Silas and even after Silas was kind of out of the picture and, and Paul and Timothy were together, and I'm sure that Timothy heard Paul preach and share about the Savior who was crucified and resurrected. I'm sure that, that Timothy heard these stories, that he, he compared the stories that he was hearing to what he saw in the law and the prophets, and it led him to have faith in Jesus. shared all this stuff with Timothy and he said you know the scriptures they talked about Jesus coming and I've taught you about Jesus and, and you've placed your faith in him so trust that stick to that hold fast to that conviction and understand because it's a value these things will help you to become the person that you ought to be and for us today we need to recognize that, that scripture our Bible is actually useful it gives us wisdom for salvation. It points us to Jesus Christ. It gives us everything that we need so that we can put our faith in Christ. Paul says that Scripture is useful for more stuff. He, he goes into this list. The Bible is useful for teaching. The Bible is useful for teaching to learn about Jesus and to understand who he is. The old, the old scripture was useful for teaching about what the law said, how they were supposed to live. 
and in the prophets, the prediction of a Messiah, the coming Savior. It's useful for rebuking. Now, we like to get that word, right? We like that part. Unfortunately, the church in modern day has become known for its rebuking and correcting. And really, in its application within the church body, it's to be holding each other accountable. It's useful for correcting, guiding us toward God's will for our lives. Again, if we look at the scripture and we read through Jesus' teaching, we read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see the activity of Christ in humanity. It teaches us. It guides us towards God's will. It allows us to compare our life against His life and make corrections into it. It's good for training in righteousness. Transforming us to become more like Jesus once we start seeing these different things in Jesus' life. We start seeing these things and it transforms us and it brings righteousness onto us. It allows us to be transformed into an entity that reflects more of Jesus Christ. And all of this, all of these things are valuable so that we are equipped for every good work. For every good work. Reading our Bible will help us to become the person God wants us to be because it reveals who He is and it teaches us what living life according to and dedicated to His will looks like. We've talked, we're only able to function out of the overflow, right? We can only love people because God loves us and we, we go and we get filled up with His love and then we go out into the world and it allows us to love the people around us. The people who don't deserve our love, we can only do this out of the overflow. And how we get to that overflow is through personal time with Christ. It is, it is through Bible study, it is through prayer, it is through coming to worship together, it is all these different things. It's dedicating our time, it is, it is making a firm decision to do something. To become the person I ought to be, we need to start with the Bible. The Bible outlines a bunch of things. It shows us how to love each other. It shows us how we should engage each other. And I just I want us to think for a minute. Whether you believe the Bible or not, whatever, if you even go up to your neighbor and whether they believe the Bible or not, here's something that you can use to engage them in conversation. Just say, hey, you know what? The Bible has this list of one another's to love one another, to encourage, you know, bear one another, like all these different things, these one another's. So even if you think all the rest of this stuff is just a bunch of malarkey, what if you read this and you were to just take all the one another statements and you, as a non-believer, were just to apply these one another things to your life? How would that change your life? How would it change the lives of your neighbors? How would it change the lives of your co-workers? If we just take something as simple as the, as the one another statements that are outlined in Scripture, if we just were to take those and nothing else, how would it impact our world? How would it change society? How would it change culture? And again, just imagine... If we move beyond just the one another, so what if we what if we took the whole thing, cover to cover, and read it and applied different principles and different facets of it to our lives? What kind of person would we become? How would that change the world? To become the me I ought to be, we should spend a few minutes every day kind of looking at God's word. I mean it's, it's breathed into existence by him. He, he, he gave these thoughts and he inspired these people to write these things down. They're actually real accounts of real activity. And then God protected it. We didn't get this version of the Bible until like 300 years after Jesus. Like it didn't start coming together until 300 years after Jesus was even 
out of the picture in physical form on the earth. God orchestrated all these different things in miraculous ways. And if God started bringing all this stuff together and He preserved it and He gave it to us, then, then don't we think that maybe we could find some useful information? Some useful insight on how to live lives that if we were to take one or two principles this year and just apply them to, the, to our lives, if we make a firm decision to do or not do based on what we read in the Bible, just one or two things. How would that transform us into the person that we ought to be? Into someone that we aspire to be? Into who God is asking us and calling us to be? Now, for some of you guys, as we kind of talk about Bible study and, and then all this stuff, you just you you see this book and you notice that it's like in, in dot o three print font, right? <laughs> so you're like if you're like me, you got the reading glasses and the magnifying glass and the magnifying glass on top of the other one. You know, you're trying to. But you look at this and you go, how how can I do this? I mean, there's there's thousands. Of pages. I mean, this 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 particular version of it. I will just tell you, the last page of actual written scripture <laughs> is eleven oh four. One thousand one hundred and four pages. Not to mention that it has two columns on every page of type zero point three. Size font. My point being, you look at this and you go, there's no way. Like, where do I begin? This is just overwhelming. And so today, as we kind of wrap things up, and as we talk about becoming the me I ought to be, our, our first kind of authentic faith step is to just commit this year to take some time to read this book. To pick it up, and whether you, know, whether you open it up and you're reading in Chronicles and you see... Judah's king Josiah, and you're, you're like, I don't understand why Josiah's reform is important to me. Yeah, I don't blame you. Let's skip over here to something else. I want to encourage everybody to start the book of John. John is a great account of Jesus' life. It's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward, it's easy to understand. If you read two chapters a day, what is it, a year? It's two years? Two chapters a day? I don't remember. Anyway, you can get through the whole thing doing two chapters a day. I'm not so much concerned about you reading it cover to cover as much as I am about you just picking it up and going, you know what, God, I want you to speak to me through this book today. I want you to speak to me through this book today. And if that means that you read one verse, if that means that you read one chapter, one book, spend some time. But a lot of you guys, you look at this and you go, you know, it's hard for me. I have a busy life. It's difficult. I can't, I can't commit. I can't get up at 8 o'clock, much less at 4 o'clock. Right? Cam and, and I are probably the only two people. I only do it on Sundays because, because Lord, that's hard. I used to do it when I was in college. And I used to run on, you know, like an hour and a half of sleep. And then I would crash during biology. But, you know, whatever. That's different stories for different days. But you look at this and you're just like, I just don't know how to do this. Like, I, Bible study? Are you kidding me? So, today, oh yeah, I guess I did give you guys that one. Reading the Bible will help me become the me I ought to be. My apologies for not sharing that one already. <clears throat> Got wrapped up in other stuff. Reading the Bible will help me become the me I ought to be. But today I want to share with you some resources. And a lot of you guys are already familiar with some of this stuff. Um, we live in a digital age. All of us have these little devices, some, some form or version of this. Maybe you have a larger version that's a, that's a tablet. But there's this wonderful app that you can grab. It's the version Bible app. And within the version Bible app, if you just go on there, you open it up on their home page, you just you don't even have to do like a full thumb flick. You just kind of move it up just a little bit and you'll see daily devotionals. 
you will see these different Bible studies, you see these different things. They even have a thing where you can sign up for the verse of the day. And it will just email or text you a verse a day. Like, it's easy. But you version Bible app. If you don't have it, go grab it. There's like a million different versions. If you grew up in church and you think the King's version, King James, you think that's the only one we should be using, I will pray for you. But it's available. If you like NLT, if you like the ESV, if you like the CSB, all these are on there. And you can just pick it. And modern technology is amazing. So if you're, if you're like on the road for a couple hours or you're just stuck in some traffic because we live in Fort Mill and Charlotte and it's stupid sometimes, um, you, can, you can push the speaker thing and it will read it to you. It's awesome. So, FYI, Version Bible app. How do you get... God's Word into you, you version Bible app. There are plenty of ways for you to step into something that, can, that you can use to get the Bible into you that will help you become the you that you ought to be. So, how many of you guys are familiar with soaping? I'm not talking about showering. <laughs> Although, some of you, we need to have them. So, so it's, it's Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. Scripture, Observation, Application, Prayer. There's a couple of different things like this star, I mean, there's a couple of, I like soap, personally. But basically what you do is, is you find a passage of scripture, and you, you spend a minute and you just read it. You read it, and then, you know, if, if you read like eight verses, maybe there's one verse that kind of jumps out to you, kind of resonates for a second, just write that verse down, just copy it down, word for word, write it down. And then you stop for a minute, and you just go, God, give me, give me some... Give me some insight on this. And you start asking some questions of the verse. You can, you can just say, okay, so who's, who's the author? Who's writing this verse? Make that observation. What are they talking about? Well, it's Paul talking about love. Okay, well, let's write that down. Whatever observations, whatever things kind of jump out to you, write those things down. And then application. Then you're like, okay, God, you gave me this verse. You showed me some of this. Some of these different things, you show me who they're talking to, what they're talking about, all this other stuff. So how do I apply this to me? How does, it, how does this fit into my life today? As a parent, as a spouse, as a person who has a 70-hour-a-week job, how does this verse apply to me? How can I take this and stick it into my life and it means something? And you just write that down. Whatever comes to you. Application. How do I apply this to my life? And then a prayer. You just write a simple prayer. Lord, today I read this passage and I would like for you to apply this prayer, this verse to my life and help me to live it out. So, blueletterbible.org. Now, blueletterbible.org is going to be for those of you who are a little bit more on the nerdy side who want to dig in if you want to go down and, and break down different words and do all this extra study and extra digging. Blueletterbible.org is a great resource for you. You can get in there. It has you can pull up a passage again, multiple different versions. It has tools. You click on the tools. They have commentaries. They have videos. They have audio stuff. There's all kinds of stuff. You can go as deep as you want to as deep as you want to dig using blueletterbible.org. It's all free. It's all free. You have our sermons, right? I give you a passage. Usually, I'm only pulling like today. We only have a few verses. You can go back through and read that chapter. Get the whole context of what Paul's talking to Timothy about. Go read the whole book. Timothy, first and second Timothy, the whole thing will take you maybe an hour to kind of just sit down and read, depending on how quickly you read through things. But you can utilize the passages that we talk about here. You already have some context because of what we talk about, but now you just go back and reread those. Reread those. We were going through the book of Ruth, right? You have the whole book of Ruth that we process through. You can go back and you can read that. I give you guys those notes. You have notebooks that are whole punched. Keep up with this stuff and you can use this. You can use this as a stepping stone to get you into Bible study. To get you into going a little bit deeper into this book. To make a firm decision to change, to do something, to not do something. 
that will make you be the person that you want to be. To help you be the person you ought to be. And I hope today as we close with all this stuff, there's a million different Bible studies. There's all kinds of stuff that you can go out there and get. But no matter what resource you use, no matter how you do it, I just want to encourage you today for us to be the person that we feel like we ought to be. The first step is just getting good information. Getting good direction. And we can do that by just opening this book up just a few minutes at a time. You'll be amazed at how much it changes you, how much it transforms you. Let's pray.